Joe, I'm just going to ask you to stare into that camera there for a minute. Give me your name, uh, who you are, what you do now. My uh, name's Joe Smarrow, and I own a company called Solution Point Plus, just retired from the San Antonio Police Department. Talk to me about that uh, crisis intervention training. What exactly is that? Yeah, so crisis intervention training, also known as CIT, is not a new concept, right? So this is something that started back in 1987, Memphis, Tennessee. Um, there was an incident involving a mentally ill individual uh, by the name of Joseph Dwayne Robinson. He was an African-American male uh, holding a knife outside and the police had dealt with him in the past, but he essentially you know, walked at, charged at, there was an incident and he ended up being shot and killed. And so the community was upset and they said, hey, we, we've gotta be able to do something better. So they partnered with the local university, they partnered with NAMI, which is the National Alliance on Mental Illness, and they created this 40 hour program. And again, this was back in 1987, 1988. So this has been around for a very long time. Yet, the latest numbers I've seen is still that 60% or more of police agencies in this country do not have the basic 40-hour CIT training. So San Antonio, um, you know, we, we developed the concept back in 2002. Uh, we got our training from the Houston Police Department, which is the largest police agency in Texas. So they were the first ones to do it. They kind of pioneered it. Uh, San Antonio went out to Houston, got the training, brought it back. The, when I went through the police academy in 2005, I didn't get any training on mental health. I went through CIT a couple years later in 2007 and before the unit existed. And you know, what, what CIT training is really is a, when it's done well, uh, our tagline was it's officer led community supported, right? And so it's very important that the officers are leading this, this training because it really is for the first responders but it's so important that you have collaboration within the community and that you bring in subject matter experts and you bring in clinicians or psychiatry and people that are experts in their fields to talk about you know, the mental illness, uh, to talk about the brain, to talk about you know, what's happening at a, at a high level. Again, not, we're not diagnosing, we're just um, learning to identify what is happening how we can best de-escalate uh, these individuals when they're suffering in a crisis, whether it's psychosis or it's suicide, whatever it is. And then we also learn about local resources. And that's such a huge piece of it because even if you've been on an agency for 10, 20 years, there's a really good chance you don't know about all of the resources that are available to you um, without this training. Well, I, th I think it's, um, you know, while it's a, it's a very simple question, I think it's a very complex answer. And I, I think, you know, uh, the reason it's taken so long is because it really does challenge um, the status quo of what is policing. You know, it, it was never meant to be where police officers were going to be the de facto responders of all societal failings, right? And if you look at how the problem became the problem, you can go all the way back to the deinstitutionalization days where, you know, there was this idea of, hey, we should be really doing these community-based treatment uh, programs or initiatives, we shouldn't be warehousing or housing uh, people just because they're mentally ill. That's a great concept, but the money never followed suit. Resources never were built up. And so now you just had displacement of people who are seriously ill and families became overwhelmed. The system never existed to support it. And so then as a byproduct, it was, well, who's going to handle this problem? Who's going to respond to these individuals? Oh, I know. We'll just call 911. Not only will we call 911, we'll call 911 and dispatch officers that have no training at all to show up and deal with this very complex issue of, hey, this person's dealing with schizoaffective disorder. They've, they haven't been on their meds for two years. They maybe have a methamphetamine addiction. Go. What do you, I mean, what do you honestly expect? I think it's such an unfair expectation that communities are placing on the first responders, whether it's police or fire that just because they wear a badge or just because they went through a police training, that they should somehow show up and know, oh, this is a person suffering from mental illness. I know, I just need to be patient. I need to keep my tone low and slow. I need to empathize with them and be compassionate. That's what I just know how to do. When I have zero clue, and, and I'll tell you, you know, to me, this was something that I had to learn firsthand. And it was an incredibly humbling experience for me my first two years on patrol in the police department, I didn't have the training. And so I would show up to calls involving people with a mental illness. And I didn't know what to do. And so the best thing I knew how to do was get creative. 
And was I helping this person? Absolutely not. Was I completely dismissive? Was I maybe insensitive? Was I, did I lack the ability to really, really um, understand what they were going through? Of course I did. And so I did nothing. And I oftentimes would just talk to them for a while, maybe placate them, minimize what they were going through just to get out of it because it was uncomfortable for me. And then when I went through the training and realized like, wow, I really missed a lot of opportunities where I could have helped these people instead of you know, dismissing them and just not knowing what to do or God forbid arresting them because they did some petty, you know, ridiculous thing like pedestrian in the roadway or a criminal trespass, um, you know, and it's like, it was just to get this problem out of the way because I didn't know what else to do. And then you go through the training and you're like, man, you know, but I'm honest enough to say like, yeah, I got it wrong and, but now I can do better. And so it's about really just learning how to improve. And I think the reason why it's difficult to get buy-in is because you're essentially, you know, you're really talking about changing, which is super uncomfortable, right? And 2020 has really shown everyone this, is that change is very uncomfortable for a lot of people. And so when you go into a police department where we typically would operate on, we're gonna do things this way because this is the way it's always been done. And when you get people that take over training academies, 15, 20 years after they went through and they wanna do things the way it was when they were there, it's really hard to progress um, you know, and, and I've said this for a long time, but very few police departments have successfully evolved at the pace of the community or the world around them. You know, society continues to evolve at a rapid rate with the, you know, uh, technology, with, you know, just the way people are learning now, the way the world is, how we have become as a people. But typically police departments just kind of, well, we're going to just keep doing the things the way we've always done them. And if you look at policies, so many of police policies are 10 years old, 20 years old, and they haven't updated. And it's just, we're, we're doing the same thing over and over because, well, this is the way it worked. This is the way it's always been done. And yeah, we might change things like equipment, guns, tasers, cars, but training, policies, mm you know, progressive styles of policing, community-oriented policing. I think we're in a position now where change is being forced on us, which is super uncomfortable, and I really believe it's an inside job. We have to want to do it from within. Joe, without effective training on how to recognize mental illness, when an officer comes into contact with someone suffering a psychotic episode, what's the likely outcome? Uh, a couple things. One is use of force becomes the most probably prevalent and obvious choice. Um, you know, I know it's not super popular, but I believe if there's, there's really one of two reasons why police officers use force. It's they're either truly afraid or they're uneducated. And I think if you can, you can narrow down every use of force incident in law enforcement to one of those two things. Now, most of them are going to say, I was afraid, I was in fear, you know, I had to do this because X, Y, Z, but it all comes down to, I was afraid for my safety or the safety of someone else. It's a great tagline, but how often are we willing to say, I just didn't know what was happening. And what I do know how to do is use the force continuum, the use of force continuum, right? My physical presence was there, I'm in uniform. My, my voice commands, I told them to, hey, stop, or don't do this, or don't do that. They didn't listen to me, and so then I had to make them do whatever I was trying to get them to do, whether it was sit down, stop what they were doing. And we have to be willing to understand, again, this is where education is such an important piece because if someone is simply symptomatic of their mental illness, they don't deserve to have force used on them. Now, if they're using violence against you or someone else, then okay, sure, but I speak from experience when I say coming from the seventh largest city dealing with over a thousand people with all different levels of crisis with firearms involved with knives involved jumpers involved and to not use force on any of them over 11 years to get them to do exactly what i wanted them to do every time which is you're essentially talking about getting them to trust you you're building rapport and you're affecting behavior change because they're digging their heels and saying no i'm not going like you're gonna have to shoot me you're gonna have to fight me you're gonna have to kill me you're gonna have to whatever it is and you just simply say like, that's not gonna happen, right? And then you just basically wait them out, you give them patience, you give them compassion, you connect with them, and you can get them to go with you and trust you. But it takes time, it takes willingness, and it takes an understanding of what that person is essentially dealing with or going through. Because again, I say this is an unfair expectation that 
The police have become the de facto responders to the mental health crisis in America. And the expectation is, you know, hey, I don't know how to help that person. I can see there's a problem. I can see that they're suffering. So I'm going to call the cops. They should know what to do. They show up. It goes bad. And then I'm going to be like, why, why did you handle it that way? Like, why did you use force on them? Like, how insensitive of you? And my rebuttal to that is always, why did you call the police? Why didn't you help them? Right? What, where, where did the sense of, like, community and neighboring go? We've lost that ability as a society, in my opinion. It used to be, even in my growing up in the 80s, my neighbors had no problem coming out and saying, Joey, you know, you better get off that lawn or you better get to school or you better do this or that and tell my dad on me. That is no longer the case, right? It's like, how dare you talk? Don't talk to my kid. That's my child. You better not say anything. We live our world through our phones. We're calling the police on everything because we don't want to deal with it ourselves. But then the moment they show up, we have this unrealistic expectation. It's like this utopian world of they're going to be master clinicians. They're going to be master lawyers. They're going to be counsel. They're going to be incredible this and that. And it's like, is that realistic? Is that fair? Tell me what the 40-hour crisis intervention training will give an officer at SPD that goes through that program. What, what does the 40-hour CIT program entail? Yeah, so, um, you know, the 40-hour CIT training, is not a one-size-fits-all at all. Uh, this is one of the perks and disadvantages of CIT not being standardized, is that it's really like, hey, do your thing. The only thing that's standardized is that it's 40 hours. Um, that's really the rules. And you know, there's, there's this um, debate back and forth um, about should CIT be mandatory or should it be voluntary? Should we only train 20% of each agency and it's only for the ones that want to do this or should we make it forced that every officer has to go through this? My opinion, it's forced. Every officer should have to go through this. It should happen at their training academy first. I think 40 hours is a start. I think it really should be 80 to 120 hours. I also think that once they graduate after two years, they should have to come back and do another 40 hours as a refresher because they're going to have a different perspective now. But and that's not a popular opinion uh, in the world of CIT, by the way. They think it should be only voluntary for people that want to do it. Uh, and my argument to that, and then I'll answer your question, is until there's an agency that says you can dispatch an officer and the officer can decline that call and say, like, ah, I don't like the way that, that one sounds. Like, oh, that one's mental health. No, thanks. Like, I'll take the next call. We don't have that luxury. So why should you get to pick and choose how equipped you are to deal with the calls you're facing? Because reality is, as an officer, you're going to face someone with mental illness. 100%. 100%. No matter if you're in a big agency or a small agency. And there's all kinds of numbers out there. I've seen, I've seen high as 50%, which I think is maybe high. I've seen as low as 10 to, 10 to 15% um, of all 911 calls have a mental health component. But I would say this. Almost 100% of 911 calls have an emotional disturbance component, right? Which, again, like, is that mental health? No, but I mean, people aren't calling the cops because things are going well, right? So even if it's like, hey, I woke up in my car stolen, I'm going to be upset by that. So I should be trained in de-escalation. I, I should be an expert in communication, right? And so to answer your question specifically about what a 40-hour CIT training looks like, um, our program, again, you know, when I started Solution Point Plus, it was because I learned a, an effective way to create a 40-hour CIT training model that works. And now the one thing that changes when we go into different communities, because we do you know, small rural areas like in the Midwest of the country that maybe have one ER, like that's their resource. And so it's like, can this training work? Yes, it can, but you also have to educate the importance of understanding maybe specialty courts or can you have you know a mental health court and, and understanding the sequential intercept model and where you fall on that for jail diversion programs our cit training we took the concept again understanding officer-led community supported and so um before i ever came here to shreveport i didn't know anyone right um you know good old justin hagler from the simple church reached out and said can you do this I said, absolutely, this is what we do. Uh, he reached out to the community, raised capital to make it happen, and told the police department, hey, we have the money, we have the guys, uh, you just need to provide the bodies to show up to this training. And it just worked. But before I came, 
part of the consulting side of that is, hey, I need a relationship with someone in the community. And this is where I was introduced to Jack, uh, Dr. James Patterson, who was phenomenal. And he was like, yes, like I want to help with this. And he gave me incredible people. And this was the first time where I, he, I was getting MDs. I was getting, you know, psychiatrists that were coming. To, and I was like, whoa, usually we get a, you know, not that it's bad, but we'll get maybe a licensed professional counselor to come in and do these trainings. And so when I saw we were getting MDs, I was super excited. But we really do rely on local subject matter experts because here's what I tell the officers. I say, look, we can come in and teach you these concepts, but if we just, I say, here's the thing, we're leaving after. You need to have relationships. For this to be effective and sustainable, you need to have relationships in your community. You calling me in South Texas to say, hey, I'm having this problem, what am I gonna do about it? I want you to know the person. I want you to know the medical director. I want you to know the CEO of this treatment provider. I want you to know, like, all the people that are making decisions, you need to have those relationships. So that at 3 a.m. on a Sunday, if you're having a problem, like, okay, I'm gonna bank that one, and then I can call them tomorrow or email them and figure out what's going on, right? And so a lot of our training is not just teaching them active listening, effective communication, de-escalation. We also teach them about the basic uh, fundamentals of mental illness. We teach them things about like schizophrenia, bipolar, uh, PTSD, we teach them about suicide, but a big part of our training and what I believe sets us apart is there's almost equal emphasis placed on the individual officer. And we teach them about police officer suicide. We teach them about officer wellness. We teach them about adverse childhood experiences. We teach them uh, through role playing. So it's not just this didactic delivery of content for 40 hours, it's, it's a mixture of my partner Jesse and I doing the training for the police uh, portion of this or the first responder because we also train the fire departments as well. But then we do role plays and we reinforce the skills that we're teaching them. And it's, pro it's a progression, right? So we'll, we'll start on a Monday just doing active listening. On Tuesday, we'll introduce psychosis. Maybe they're, they're hearing voices, they're um, you know, delusional, whatever it is. And can they effectively de-escalate uh, using the skills that we teach them? Wednesday, we'll introduce suicide, how to do a proper suicide assessment. Thursday, they get a break from the role plays because we'll bring in a community panel. And uh, this is where it broke my heart when I found out that, you know, Shreveport, Bossier City didn't have a local NAMI chapter anymore. Uh, I think the closest one I think they said was Lake Charles. And so not having a local NAMI here was like, oh, man, it, it's because it is an important piece of a successful program. And I, I've heard from um, NAMI, Louisiana, that they are talking about trying to, and Dr. Patterson, Patterson as well, is, is trying to get NAMI back here. Um, but we, but even, even still, through Dr. Patterson, through one of the programs, we found an incredible woman who was willing to come forward and share her story. And the reason this is important is because the officers are in a safe space, they're in a training environment, and they're dealing with a woman that they maybe have some pre-existing knowledge of, but she's not in crisis at the moment. And she's getting to show up as a human being talking about, hey, this is what happened, this is my experience. Mm -hmm. The officers are getting to see her through a different lens. And then you start to see this like aha moment of like, wait a minute. And we'll usually do a panel, you know, four to six um, people with lived experiences that are willing to come forward and say, this is my diagnosis. I've had this run in with law enforcement. I was addicted to this or that. I'm in treatment. And this is what I would love for you guys to know. Uh, but really what it comes down to is I'm a person before anything. And then Friday is test day and we give them a written test they have to pass. And then we give them a role play test where the time is extended and they have to pass that one. Uh, throughout the week, we're building them up. We're encouraging them. Friday is test day. They have to pass the actual role play scenario. Um, and, and, you know, and then we give them a certification saying like, yes, we say that you are, in our opinion, who we would deem ourselves as experts in this field, you are equipped to effectively do this, um, this you know, crisis intervention approach on these calls. And the feedback we've gotten from the officers that have already gone through our program here locally has been absolutely incredible for us. Um, I, I tell people, I'm not just saying this because I'm here, but it has really been uh, one of our favorite groups uh, because they're so hungry for this training. They're so hungry and optimistic about the value of what this training could provide.